This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Prologue Perched on a sandspit, jutting into the muddy waters of Kingston Bay, Port Royal is a sleepy fishing village of 1,600 souls. It is an unassuming place. The sound of the waves slapping the seashore is interrupted only by the fast patrol boats of the Jamaica Defence Force. The locals get by on the profits, hooked by a handful of marlin fishermen and a few dollars brought in by occasional tourists seeking an insight into Jamaica's murky past. Those who venture out from the resorts to the north and east of the island, and make their way via Michael Manley International Airport and the scrub and sand dunes of the Palisados, are rewarded by the sight of a handful of relics which pay tribute to Port Royal's former prominence. Half a mile to the east of town, as the spit narrows, is the eighteenth-century naval cemetery. Crooked gravestones, adorned by weather-worn inscriptions, bear witness to the toll yellow fever took on the Royal Navy seamen whose base once dominated town. Beyond is the ruin of an octagonal tower, part of the seventeenth-century Fort Rupert. The rest lies under a shallow lagoon whose waters also conceal a large fragment of a brick battery wall. Further on, Visitors pass Morgan's Harbour, a hotel named after the most famous of Port Royal's former inhabitants, a Welsh farmer turned Caribbean privateer who terrorised the Spanish colonies and rose to the post of Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica. Beyond Morgan's is St. Peter's Church. Built in 1725-26, to 26, the present building lies atop the ruins of its predecessor, destroyed on June the 7th, 1692. An inscription on a gravestone illuminates the events of that day. Here lays the body of Louis Galdi. He was swallowed up in the great earthquake, and by the providence of God was, by another shock, thrown into the sea and miraculously saved by swimming until a boat took him up. Galdi was fortunate indeed. A third of Port Royal sank beneath the sea that day, and a third of its 6,500 inhabitants were killed. Buried in the mud and murk of Kingston Bay are the remains of Port Royal's drowned streets. An array of 17th-century artifacts have been found, silver pieces of eight and gold doubloons imported by merchants who once traded with the cities of Portobello and Cartagena finely crafted pocket watches, gold rings, fragile Chinese porcelain, cannonballs, rusty pistols and swords, a vast array of broken rum, porter, beer and wine bottles, iron balances and lead weights, thousands of fragments of clay pipes, and coral-encrusted chains, collars and manacles, once used to constrain the slaves, on whose labours the island's legendary former wealth was built. In England, the second half of the seventeenth century was a period of great change, where issues of religion, family and clan ties, and the struggle between Parliament and the Crown had dominated the early Stuart era. Trade, the generation of wealth, and the rise of science and the arts grew in importance after the Restoration in 1660. Three Anglo-Dutch wars and a series of navigation acts prohibiting foreign ships from trading with England's colonies saw the country eclipse the United Netherlands as the leading European player in global trade. This growth was mirrored by an interest in colonial possessions, England's economic and political influence spread along the shores of West Africa, among the islands of the West Indies, the eastern seaboard of North America, and the subcontinent of India. In 1688, the Glorious Revolution saw James II, England's last Catholic monarch and would-be emulator of Louis XIV's absolutist France, usurped by the Dutch stadtholder William of Orange. 
The Bill of Rights, passed in 1690, sealed the government's primacy over the crown. The new constitutional monarchs, William and Mary, were unable to suspend laws, levy taxes, make royal appointments, or maintain a standing army without Parliament's permission.